Hey there, hi there, ho there. If I say any more, we're getting in legal trouble. So welcome to Pop Go the Writers. You're supposed to say you're as welcome as can be. Yeah, see, that's where you get into legal troubles. Oh. But you said ho. I did. I did say ho. Yeah, all right. And you said you were high, so come on. Oh, I should be at this point, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Um, hey, everybody, we uh, are going to do something a tiny tad, a little bit different today. Is we're really going to focus on one main topic, and that main topic, of course, is going to be why DC Comics made uh, Plastic or uh, Elongated Man after they already bought Plastic Man. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm. <laughs> That, that, that is a fun... That's not a bad one, yeah. But And they already had... Um, ela- um, they already had Jimmy Olsen as Elastic Lad. Yeah, well, I mean, the bottom line the reason they created Elongated Man was because the writer and the artist didn't know they had Plastic Man at that point. You know, they were unaware that, Mar- that DC had bought out that company, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. so they suddenly had two stretchy guys. Oh, oh! Did DC just not know what to do with Plastic Man? Um, I I just recently reread all two hundred issues of the Brave and the Bold, and Plastic Man is in that a couple times. And in those first few stories with him, they just they uh, Bob Haney thought that Plastic Man was literally made out of plastic, and he like blew him up a couple of times. It's really sad. Yeah. Well, great topic. Uh, I love it. <laughs> Not the topic we're going to do today. We're actually going to talk about, uh, by the way, was Elongated Man and Plastic Man before Mr. Fantastic? Uh, Mr. Fantastic is 61. Plastic Man is the 40s. Um, and Elongated Man is like, mm, wow. You know, that would be, because, boy. He's pretty. He's kind of early on in the Flash, but I'm going to guess that he's after '61. Okay. Because Flash is like 1958, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure Reed Richards is before Ralph Dibney, but not neither of them before Pla- uh, Plastic Man. Yeah. All right. So our topic today is, uh, you guys may have seen it. Uh, Zack Snyder was being interviewed on the Joe Rogan show. And no, I don't want to listen to the Joe Rogan show, but this is where it took place. And he was discussing um, Batman and he said, and I'm, I'm going to quote him here. He says, people are always like Batman can't kill. So Batman can't kill his cannon. And I'm like, okay, well, the first thing I want to do when you say that is I want to see what happens. And they go, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. I'm like, well, you're just like, you're protecting your God in a weird way, right? You're making your God irrelevant. Now, that, of course, has made a bunch of, uh, hey, Ed, that's made a bunch of people uh, uh, shorten it down to Zack Snyder says that if Batman can't kill, he's irrelevant. And I, I mean, I can see you making that connection. It's kind of what he said. But, well, wait, um, wait a minute. What did he say then? Because <laughs> I, because I don't speak that his weird language, so I'm not, I'm not completely sure I understand him. Well, he's, he wants to explore what would happen if Batman did kill, like he did with Superman. Yes. Well, kind mm-hmm. of. And there are some comics out there that do that. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Zach, uh, it's not not Zack Snyder's, but um, Scott Snyder is the Batman who laughs is a Batman who killed and kept going down that path. Yeah. There's also an amazing Elseworld book called Batman Ego by the late Darwin Cook. Mm -hmm. And that's an exploration of that as well. And also you can look at Under the Red Hood, the um, Judd Winnick story, where Jason Todd comes back and he wants to know why Batman didn't kill Joker. And there's the uh, Azrael Batman, and at that time, 
trying to remember who who was writing that. And they said in an interview that they said this is this is to show why Batman doesn't kill. Like they specifically said they did that storyline just to show everybody why it's not a very good idea to have a Batman who kills. Yeah. And by the way, if you're watching the show right now, we got a few people on who's looking good. Uh, a, please hit the, the thumbs up or the like buttons, but jump in. Let me know if you think Batman should or shouldn't kill, or if you have, you know, what's your thoughts on that? And if he doesn't kill, why do you think that is? We're going to talk about all that tonight. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that early on when uh, Bob uh, Bob Kane and Bill Finger created Batman, the, the character did kill. Mm -hmm. In his first appearance in Detective Comics 27, there is a gentleman named Stryker who falls off of a um, walkway and into a vat of chemicals. And uh, I realize that that sounds like the Joker, but it's not. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this was before Joker. This was them just, I, I think in Gotham, the amount of people that fall off of walkways into, uh, into chemicals is extremely high. Mm -hmm. And Batman made no attempt to try to rescue him and even said that it was a fitting end for mm. someone like him. For his kind, yep. For his kind, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Jay's commented, that's what we have Owlman. Uh, let me go ahead and pop that up there. That's what we have Owlman and Thomas Wayne, Bruce Batman. Bruce Wayne's Batman has killed in the past. That doesn't mean he should now. Good, good answer. Mm -hmm. So, um, but... Later, in uh, the first actual Batman comic, uh, Br Batman is going after some thugs in a truck. And I don't remember what, what's in the truck, but he is in the Bat plane. And there is a machine gun attached to the Bat plane. And he says the quote, uh, I don't like taking human life, but in this case, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And he just mows them down with a plane, with a with machine gun. Mm -hmm. That was your early Batman, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, you uh, know why, and you know why that was, right? Well, I know that Bob Kane wanted Batman to be a pulp hero, kind yes. of like the Shadow. Yes, that's know, exactly what it is. Like yep. Yep. Yeah, so. You know, because the uh, idea like, of what we think of today as the superhero was only really just beginning they you know they were extensions of the pulp heroes of the day and other, well doc savage actually did have a code against killing it happened every once in a while but it but he was against it in general and usually yeah. got mad at his uh his, his, the his men if they did it um, yeah but but yeah back in those days it was they were just the pulp characters and that's what they did. You know, they came out of a, of a rough time, the Depression. You yeah. know, it was the superhero thing hadn't really kicked in yet. Yeah, and I think the Avenger, that was always just part of his plan. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gonna yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it, you know what? It's funny. is It's pretty much just Doc Savage. Uh, Doc Savage does, he doesn't have the code of killing, I think, in the first two adventures. And then suddenly it kicks in. Yeah. Um, but um, but and it's the same with Batman. They just it was never really a thought until they realized that a lot of kids were reading it and and they could do something different and better with it. Right. Now, the reason this happened is kind of the same reason that um, Robin got added to the story. Mm -hmm. is because they realized that there were a lot of kids reading the book mm -hmm. and that it was a bad idea to have all this murder and shooting going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm trying to look for his name. I'm, I'm trying to look for the editor that actually decided. There it is, Whitney Ellsworth. Whitney Ellsworth, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Whitney Ellsworth basically gave the no-kill order when he realized that millions, and back then it was millions of children, we're reading Batman. 
Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. The the audience is quite different. Um, you know, back then, you know, yeah, it's mostly children and soldiers who was who were reading comics. And yeah, it wasn't unusual to sell, you know, a million or more copies of a single comic book. Today, if a if something sold if a copy of a comic book sold a million, that would be astronomical. Oh yeah. Mike says Batman shouldn't kill or use a gun that makes him different. Mm -hmm. True. But it's interesting that, well, we, we need to get to that, but it's almost like a Green Hornet thing with the Green Hornet pretending he's a bad guy, but, you know, he's not. Batman shouldn't kill, but he, but also the bad guy is thinking that he might. Mm -hmm. I think that's important for him to be effective. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. Um, um, Superman uses that logic in in his first. God, I think it's literally like uh, his first adventure, or second adventure. He there's the threat of of letting somebody fall to their death, you know, yeah. or, or something like that, and and to get the guy to to talk. Um, Superman's like a really interesting case too. And I know we're here to talk about Batman, but he was the same way, you know, it grew out of a different, um, sort of thing. And until they realized that what they were building and growing could be that, that different thing. Um, yeah. you know, the thing about Batman using a gun is to me has always been, oh, there's always been an overreaction to that. If I remember correctly, there's, there's 11 stories before Robin appears and in those 11 stories, I, honestly, I think he literally is shown with like a pistol or revolver like twice. And then, yeah, the, yeah there's the example of using the machine gun and from the uh, it's the bat gyro uh, yeah. in, the, in those days. Yeah, because and that's because the um, the shadow had an auto gyro. So, you know, the Batman, Batman is totally the shadow. In fact, that very first story, the case of the chemical syndicate is mm -hmm. completely and utterly ripped off from uh, a shadow story. Um, you know, it, it, it's funny is this is a different character, of course, but a lot of people say that Moon Knight is Marvel's Batman. Mm -hmm. And no, no, Moon Knight is Marvel's shadow. If you look at the uh, sure. alter egos, the, mm -hmm. the psychoses and stuff like that, mm -hmm. he be he better lines up for the shadow than yep. he does for Batman. Yep, that's a that's a really good point. I don't remember if Moon Knight killed in the beginning. Well, he's a mercenary. I think he probably has. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he okay, yes, he begins as, like, I don't know, it, once he starts operating as Moon Knight, if he was still doing it. But yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, that is a that is actually a really good point. So you can say more that Batman and Moon Knight, you know, uh, launched from the same platform, from the same platform. Yeah. Different, different direction. Yep, yeah. 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 All right, Ed says... I don't like the idea of Batman using a gun, but I also don't have a problem with him killing a bad guy. If they're fighting on a roof and kicks a guy off the roof, I'm okay with it, but not a gun. Now, there's something I've noticed. If you read the comics, Batman doesn't kill. Usually. If you watched, you grew up on the Adam West series, Batman didn't kill. Right. But if your experience with Batman is Michael Keaton, Ben Affleck, Christian Bale, they've all killed in the movies. Mm -hmm. In truth, the only Batman so far in all of the films that didn't specifically take a life is Robert Pattinson, the newest one. I'll take your word for it because I haven't seen I haven't seen that. I did the research. Okay, good for you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, huh. and one of the things I'm thinking about on Zack Snyder and why he thinks that is because Z Snyder talks about his influences, and the ma majority of the things he points out are by authors who are known for being deconstructionists. Mm -hmm. Alan Moore, Frank Miller, uh, Grant Morrison. Mm -hmm. All of them tend to take apart Garth Ennis. They take apart superheroes. Yep. 
you know? Yep. And if that's the, where your influences come from and you've grown up where Batman not killing isn't that big a deal because it's, you've never seen that. You know, if yeah. you're just watching the movies, the uh, Batman 2, or the, the second Batman, Batman Returns, when he's fighting the clowns. Yeah, I knew you were going to say this part, yeah. Mm -hmm. He sticks a bomb in the one guy's pants and puts him in a hole and he blows up. Yeah. You know? Christian Bale basically torches Ra's al Ghul's training facility, and a lot of them don't get out alive. Mm-hmm. Did you, you know? see the Val, Val Kilmer's Batman does? Yeah, I'm trying to remember where it was, but and and George Clooney's Batman does is that right? Clooney's may not have. I I don't okay. remember if I found that one, but I, to me they're supposed to be the same character, the same. Yeah, I know. I get. Yes, yes. Strangely enough, that's true. Yes, yeah. I get. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Kilmer's did. Okay. But I don't remember about Clooney's. So. It's been way too long since I've seen this movie. How does Ben Affleck's Batman kill? Because I haven't seen any of that. Uh, well, there's one point where he's uh, using the machine guns on the uh, Batmobile to fire oh, out the bad yeah. guys. And then there's this scene where he goes to rescue Martha Kent mm -hmm. and uh, is just wiping out all these guards. And, mm. you and you don't see them die, but you're like, He's dead. That guy is dead. And he definitely kills KG Beast. You know, um, there's, again, there's how many, I'm not sure the exact number. I can't remember. There's a few stories before Batman's origin is presented. He doesn't begin, you know, with, with an origin. Right. But once we real we discover that he his parents were murdered, you know, in an alley by a guy with a gun, um, I think that's kind of where everything changes, and the and the and to me, it's that shores up the he you know he refuses to use guns. You know, his parents were murdered by a gun. He refuses to use guns, so you can cut him. You can cut the character some slack up until that point. But once you hit that point, then to me, that all fits in together. I know people could argue that no, it's the other way around. You know, he gets he gets even more, you know, more crazy or into guns or whatever. But but yeah, I, I mean, don't he could have like that. He I could have went down the path of the Punisher. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, I know. See, but but see, that's that's what I like about Batman and heroes who don't kill because it does make them different. Even more so today, back in the 50s and 60s, it wasn't, you know, the, I can't even think of any heroes that, superheroes that actually killed. But but today, it really sets them apart. You know, why have Batman be just like any other character? Why he's not the Punisher? Why make him like the Punisher? Right. I never, you know, I never saw that. I like it because to me, it makes the character have to think more. You know, and we go back to the Zack Snyder's Man of Steel again. I, you know, I've argued that since that movie came out. Uh, right. If you're going to put him in that situation, then have him think his way out instead of just taking the easy path, which is to kill Zod. Spoiler alert. Yeah, Jay says if if I remember right, Superman didn't fly in the comics at first. Couldn't imagine That's him in that costume today and just jumping everywhere. He did. He he leapt tall buildings. In yep. a single bound, that's where that line comes from. Yep, it's all um, jumping. It's but, like the Hulk. <laughs> but um, I look at um, when Ellsworth came in and made that edict, you're right. Bob Kane wrote in his, bio his uh, biography that he was upset by that because it was losing the connection to the pulp heroes. Bill mm. Finger, on the other hand, was upset that he had let the character kill prior to that. Because he sees that as the same way as you watch somebody murdered in front of you, you wouldn't want to use a gun. You wouldn't want other people to feel that. And I think in a lot of ways that might have also informed Superman from the beginning because was uh, was it Jerry Siegel whose father was murdered? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. He was shot. Well, uh, by, by a burglar or something like that. And again, 
I could see that being, you know, that was him dealing with grief. Superman was him dealing with grief. Yeah. Yep. Let's put it all on the page. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. Ed says that Batman is really good. I highly recommend you give it a try, Jim. I agree. Oh, oh the movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am a huge fan of the Batman movie. I'm disappointed that the sequel got postponed a year. Mm. So uh, uh, Ed says, didn't Val Kilmer kill Two-Face and a few of his henchmen? And Jay confirms Kil Kilmer did toss, cost to toss the coin, which Boy, and, uh, Tommy Lee Jones' character died. I don't remember that. I mean, it's whew, it's been too long since I've seen that movie, you know. Yep. Oh, and Ed also says uh, Clooney killed one, too. It's Batman. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. A recent story did say Bruce is a marksman. Try to remember the story. Yeah, no, I oh, yeah. and to me that makes sense. I, I I can totally accept that that in the Batcave he's practiced and practiced and practiced. Um, he should know every weapon that's out there. He should know exactly how it works, how to exactly. use it, and all of that. You know, but as far as using it in the field. When he can be way more clever, cleverer, and and design things, you know, to to get around that. Um, uh, there's been a couple of stories over the many years where, like Commissioner Gordon has asked Batman, "Why don't you know? I can't understand why you don't carry a gun." There's one in particular I'm thinking of, and Batman says, "Just I just don't like him." <laughs> Well, see, and that's, I think it's, it's a good place to go next is the reason he doesn't use the guns. Mm -hmm. Now, what you talked about, again, that was the popular one for a very long time. Yeah. That he saw his parents murdered and, you know, it just doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, it, he doesn't want to have anybody feel that way that he, he feels. Mm -hmm. But m more recently... Uh, writers have come along and tried to push the envelope on that. Yeah. And the, 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 some of the stories I mentioned earlier, Darwin Cooks, Judd Winnicks, and, uh, you know, they explore it that it's more than just that. And they almost liken him to being an alcoholic in the sense that if he kills once, he's going to keep doing it. You know, if you have that one drink and then, yeah. So once he loses that reason not to do it, he's just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And you look at some of the villains in Gotham and some of the horrendous things they did. You know, if he killed the Joker for uh, for uh, killing Jason Todd, you could see him start starting to justify killing other bad guys. Yeah. yeah. You know. Mr. Freeze froze all these people to death. Yeah. Well, got to take out Mr. Freeze. There's an Killer old... Rock, eight people. Got to kill Killer Rock. There's an old cliche that is used in, you know, superhero fiction and TV movies and everything. Uh, I still like it, although some people today will, you know, make fun of it and tear it down. But there is the old, if you do that, you are no better than the than the guy you're fighting, you know? Yeah. And I hate that it, that's really become very, you know, uh, demeaned uh, over the years, but I think there still is something to be said about that. And I think that goes back to that whole idea of building the concept of the superhero who is more than just a hero, thus a superhero above and beyond just, being your garden variety, you know, hero. But I've always yeah. kind of liked that. So I think that that's a, you know, a part of it too. And I'm sure there's Batman stories left and right all through the years that, that have said pretty much that same thing. Um, um, you, you know, real quick, because I brought up Doc Savage before, and Doc Savage came along in 1933, six years before uh, Batman came along. Doc Savage his whole thing once they determine that he won't kill thing and he does not like using guns that kind of came out of that too there were um doc savage's reasoning was that to use a gun uh you then get you place a reliance upon it like it's too easy 
and you get used to the idea of carrying a gun and using a gun and once you get that taken away from you then then you're you know you're nothing and that was his whole thing about criminals you know no criminals use guns because they're cowardly and they're you know um just so devoted to this idea of a gun and with killing that once you take that away from them then they're nothing and they're easy to defeat so yeah. so much of of batman you know also comes from that idea as well as the shadow who yeah mowed down criminals left and right two automatics you know pop 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 and it, it's all over but very different character now ah, here's a good question from mike would joker last with frank castle in the picture doubt it no no because i want to see that the marvel universe doesn't have or the Marvel universe tends to be more lethal than the DC universe. Mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's necessarily true because there is a mirror character, not so much in powers or anything like that, but in origin to Batman and that Spider-Man, the death of a loved one in front of them and somewhat from their own actions, Batman wanted to leave the movie or play or whatever it is, mm -hmm. or Bruce Wayne. Uh, Peter Parker, you know, finding his Uncle Ben and then not stopping the guy who killed him. That kind of fuels not only him being Spider-Man, but it also fuels him not being lethal. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see that as being a major part to the, 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 the psyche of both Bruce Wayne and Peter Parker. And it also is why, if you extrapolate that out, why uh, Peter Parker makes the deal with Mephisto or, or was willing to, I think it's Mary Jane who makes it, but right. it is because to lose Aunt May would be like another, he's already lost Uncle Ben mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of the way he lost she is so is like doubly more important than yeah. anybody else. Yeah. So yeah. But this is this is interesting. Uh because we talk about um deconstructionist writers. Grant Morrison has come out about this story, about the whole idea. Uh, oh, I don't think I've heard this. Okay. Of Batman's decision not to kill. And uh his comment is. Uh, that Batman puts himself in danger every night but steadfastly refuses to murder is an essential element of the character's magnificent, horrendous, childlike psychosis. Bruce Wayne never really grew out of that childlike state, struck forever as the little boy who lost his parents in Crime Alley. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if I would liken Batman to a child in his but but you can also see some elements of it in sense of his obsessions um you know and Alfred is kind of like a father figure still to this day yeah it, you know I can I can kind of see what he he is saying if if you're one of the people who believes that, that Bruce Wayne is a broken person, you know, that he's, that he is nuts in, in a yeah. way, you know, and I know there's some people who don't, I've actually over the years grown to accept the idea of him as a broken person. So if he's saying that he was broken as a child and that he is stuck there, I don't know if I, I can't really agree literally that he is a child, but yeah, I guess in some way he does have a he's holding on to something in a childlike way you know and can't grow past that um the other thing is is that people always complain about the character of batman today being you know cold uh and uh detached and all of that well one of the things i think that maybe this is what i'd like to think that bruce also holds on to this idea of preserving life is that he knows that once he crosses that line that that might be one of his last links to humanity 
you know yeah. that and this is funny because this is actually going on at this very moment in batman um and it's funny because it has a connection with uh bruce or grant morrison grant morrison um took the idea of the batman of zur and r from the 1950s and yeah. turned it into something very different now um uh chip zadarsky has brought that back and he's basically saying now that that uh bruce created this different persona he created the ultimate batman as a like a fail safe in his own brain but what that the difference is is that is that being the ultimate Batman means you do whatever is necessary. And if that means killing, then that's what you do. This is all going on at, at this very moment in the comics. And it's all very good stuff, too. I'm, I'm actually a pretty big fan of Chip Zdarsky and Grant Morrison. Yeah. Ed says, Spider-Man No Way Home drove home the point of heroes shouldn't kill when Tommy McGuire stopped Tom Holland from killing. But the MCU has had heroes kill a lot. Cap killed with a machine gun. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. The, 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 but Hollywood, he kept the soldier, though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hollywood hasn't clung to the uh, killing or no kill, the no kill thing like, you know, the comics have. Um, it's, it's, it should be a rare thing when a hero kills, an extreme thing. Well, but I'm going to address it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like I, I'm going to go to a very odd place where I think Zack Snyder almost had it right. Mm. Not with Superman. Mm. It's, I, I know a lot of, and, with, and I know a lot of people don't like Superman snapping Zod's neck or Batman stopping in the middle of a fight when Superman mentions Martha. Those are two of the scenes that people get the most about on Zack Snyder. And I think part of the problem is he didn't show the ramifications of the Zod killing. Yeah, correct. If, if it really would have hurt Clark, if he would have felt it, if it was a desperation thing, he could have pulled that off. But I'm not looking at that one right now. I'm looking at the Martha scene. Mm. Because what he set up, had he paid a little more time, if there was a scene earlier on where Batman is putting together the weapons he's going to use against Superman along with the, the armor and he is talking to Alfred and he talked to him about, and Alfred's like, those seem to be lethal. Are you sure about this? And if Batman's, if Bruce's response is he's not human, hmm. he's an alien He's a threat to everyone on this planet. Mm. And you see that he's justifying it because he doesn't believe Clark is human. Mm -hmm. And then the moment comes and he says, Martha. And, you know, he says, why do you say that name? And that's his mother. He has a mother. Mm. Just the realization, the humanization of Superman at that moment makes that whole scene work. Hmm. But I think he needed a setup for it earlier on in the film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There that might might have worked it with Man of Steel. And I've always said that that's what really bugged me about that whole Man of Steel thing is that if you're going to go down that road, I wouldn't have gone down that road in the first place. But if you're going to go down that road, then you've got to show all the ramifications for it. They did it in the comic books. John Byrne had Superman kill uh, uh, Zod, Ursa, and Nan, or whatever it was from a different uh, universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, then they went on. My God, that story, the, the storyline about the ramifications went on for more than a year. It was an immense storyline where he exiled himself from Earth. And and all of that, you know what? That's what you do. Then then you have to deal with that at all. I remember Man of Steel. He cries right at that moment, and then the next thing we see, he's all smiles and grins, and he's Clark Kent now, and he's got a new job, and you know, a girlfriend, and everything's all hunky dory, you know, again. Yeah. 
and and then they never really deal with it. Here's a good question from Ed. No. Did, did Christopher <laughs> Reeve kill Zod? Nope. He crushed his hand and threw him in the pit, and Nod nope. just jumped in the pit, and Lois punched Ursa, Ursa into the pit, right? Yep. They didn't Two. do anything with them after the pit. Did they get out I of know. the pit? Yes. Well, like suddenly the pit became a transfer portal to the, uh, the, um, the, oh, the, phantom, the phantom, phantom Zone. I I know it's, it's a de- universal thing for the Phantom Zone. I know it's a it's a deleted scene, but there is a deleted scene that shows them uh, being taken away by the police. Um, that 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 the pit is just a holding. It's like a a jail cell kind of a thing. They were depowered first. They were depowered first, and that was just a holding thing. Here's the thing: all without that scene. This is so funny. When I first heard that people brought brought that up and said, look, he killed... I remember, and it was around the time of Man of Steel. I had gone all those years without that ever, ever occurring to me. When I saw Superman 2, and I was a kid, or a very young teenager, it never occurred to me. I, I always thought it was just a holding you know, facility, that it never even remotely occurred to me that he killed them. And I just could not fathom where anybody got that from. And that and that was before that I saw that deleted scene. It's in I think they added it back in when they showed it on, on network television. You yeah, know, or it might have been in the Donner cut. Yeah. And it's and it's and it's clumsy, and I get that now when you look at it that way, that they chopped that out but didn't bother to address it in what was left. And they really should have, you know. But I just I was like, what the hell do you mean he killed the three of them? Like no, not the Christopher Reeve Superman. No, Ed says Superman really crossed a the line there, though. He hadn't they had no powers, he did. So he was being a bully by destroying Zod's hand. That wasn't necessary, right? It was not necessary, but I don't equate that with killing him. Yeah. Mike says, just seems Batman was more Lex Luthor than Lex Luthor in the Snyderverse there. Yeah, I could I could see that. Mm. So so, all right. So now, now, now that we've boiled that down, I look at. I mean, I know my of my approach to writing when I'm writing a character somebody else owns, mm-hmm. and uh, my best examples have to do with the books I did for Moonstone, and you've done some of them as well. I wrote for the Avenger. I wrote for. Uh, Green Hornet, and I wrote for The Phantom Mm -hmm. and one of their vampire books. But Mm -hmm. with The Phantom, I I already knew that character, but I looked at that character and I said, okay, the legacy of The Phantom is a huge part of the character. All the different people who played, who have been The Phantom take it seriously. The history, the books, and everything else. Yeah. So I went, okay, how do we make that part of the story? And the story I ended up doing was a story of a mercenary who was hired to kill the Phantom. And the way he works is he studies his opponent or his target to get to know him as well as they know themselves. And in doing so, he started learning all this stuff about the Phantom. And the Phantom was away from Nepal. So he actually found the skull cave Mm. and really got into it. And so when he approached, he actually approached him as the phantom as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it also led to his defeat, but you'll have to read the book for that. You know, I'm, I'm intrigued. So maybe I, real quick, is it, was it comics or prose? Prose. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. By the way, Having an unnamed person dressed as a phantom fighting the phantom is a horrible thing to do in prose because <laughs> you don't have many descriptors to use to differentiate between yeah. the two. <laughs> that one guy punches punched the phantom, and the phantom punched that one guy back. The fake phantom. The, <laughs> yeah. the ghost who walks next the ghost who doesn't walk. <laughs> 
I know uh, if anybody can do it, it's you, Dan. I know that you, I'm sure it's great. <laughs> and with the Green Hornet, I always loved the fact that he was known as a criminal. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what would happen? And, and, you know, in the past, amnesia was a regular occurrence for heroes. Mm -hmm. What if he ended up being pulled out of Lake Erie or whatever, you know, whatever the, I think it's Lake Erie, whatever the big lake is off the coast of Chicago. Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan. Okay. Mm -hmm. By a smuggler and uh, has no memory because he lost it in an explosion mm -hmm. thrown out of a building. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's putting his pieces of his memory together back together is this smuggler who believes he's a criminal. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's given him all the information from the point of view of a bad guy. Right. So and that's how, that's the first story I did. But by the way, I, I love that story because that's the story I introduced a character named Eugene Pops Roberts as the smuggler. Uh -huh. And he's my dad. My dad grew up in Chicago. I made the character for my dad. And okay. my dad got to read the story. My dad grew up a Green Hornet fan listening to it on the radio. That's But your dad was not a smuggler, though, right? <laughs> No. Okay. I'm gonna go with no. Okay. <laughs> Good. Any everything but that part of it, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I got to bring him back in the second Green Hornet story I did. That's because great. the first one I said that he wanted to retire and just like run a news a newsstand, something simple where he can say hi to people and 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 doesn't have to worry about things. And of course, because he helped Britt read, Britt got him his newsstand, you know. And so in the next episode, the next one, which was written from uh, uh, Axel, uh, Ax, Axford's point of view, he goes to Pops to get information because Pops still has an ear to the ground. Love so it. I got to bring him back. So, cool. yeah, I got to put my dad in two That's Green great. Hornet stories. That's great. So, but what about you? What, uh, you know, so my, my point was that if I was looking at Batman, and I was fascinated about the no-kill thing, mm -hmm. then, yeah, I could see wanting to push him to the edge, push him to the point whether it's somebody so violent that he has to kill or somebody that won't stop unless he's killed. Yeah. You know, and testing that. But I don't think I'd want to cross that line. No. It, I think the only reason to do a story like that is to show everybody what what the guy is made of and why he is the way he is and why he you know why he doesn't kill you know um i i don't believe in zack snyder's um reasoning is not the way like you talked about those writers who are deconstructionists yeah and yes they are but and they i think they had very good reasons for being deconstructionists and wanting to do that. I have yet to see anything out of Zack Snyder that is anything except I want to do it because it'll be really cool and um, it'll be shocking. Like it just has shock value, you know, instead of a, you know, legitimate thing. We've come so far from, from Watchmen. I mean, to me, Watchmen was the ultimate exploration of deconstruction of, of superheroes. And, you know, that yeah. was Alan Moore's purpose, you yeah. know, in the whole thing. He wanted to deconstruct the Charlton heroes and they didn't want they didn't want him to do that. They had just gotten those toys and they didn't want him to break, you know, yeah. so he gets his own thing. Um, I mean, I personally am not that interested in that l line of reasoning. A lot of that is probably from the era that I came out of. I always tell people I most likely saw the Batman TV show before I actually got my first Batman comic book. You know, um, I mean, I came out of the sunniest era for the most part uh, of, of Batman. And that's probably why I am the way I am. I, it never, I never thought any other way, you know, superheroes did not kill. Um, I grew up a DC kid. You're absolutely right about Marvel. Marvel was supposed to be the world outside your window. Yeah. You know, um, the Marvel New York is supposed to be as, you know, as gritty. And, and so that's why we have characters like the Punisher, 
you know, but. You know, it's funny. I actually think I enjoy DC more now reading mm -hmm. them than mm -hmm. I do Marvel, where I grew up a Marvel kid. My first books were Marvel. I collected all Marvel, barely read DC. And yeah. I think now it's, as I know more about the real world, the less I want to read about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. My, I read probably right now about equal amount DC and Marvel. The, 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 the only sad thing to me is, is that I don't feel like there's much difference between the two. Um, when, when I was a kid and first getting comics, there was a v marked difference in tone, look, everything between Marvel and DC. They're the exact same. Nowadays, it's the exact same tone, the exact same look. Um, you know, there's really, they do not have a flavor all their own. The DC universe is pretty much the same flavor as the Marvel universe. I just don't see, you know, there's, and that's a lot of that's because DC took a long, long time to do it, but they, they had to crawl up from what they were doing and become the Marvel universe if they wanted to sell, you know. So, and so many writers go back and forth now. They, they, they yeah. don't change their tones or anything. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, that's totally, and the artists too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can almost always be guaranteed that, that, that if you like this artist in, in about a year, he's going to be over at the other company. And then a year after that, he, you know, John Byrne was the best example of that. You know, he was constantly going, you know, Mark Wade, love him to death, but he jumped but, back and forth. A lot. In a lot of ways, John Byrne and uh, Frank Miller moving over to DC uh, is what started it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, Jeff Frank Jeff. Miller is one of those guys that started breaking down the gun thing because in Dark Knight Returns, there's that famous scene that Batman's up on a rooftop and I can't remember what it is. If there's something flying like a helicopter, I can't. And he says something, something, something. Good thing I brought the gun. And then, he, you know, but it's and then we learn that I can't remember what exactly it shoots, but it's not a gun gun. Yeah. You know, but. It's that whole idea of, oh, my God, Batman has a rifle and he's using it. What? And then and then it's like, but you're not going to go that far. It really is. It, I can't remember what it shot, but but I, that was shocking back then. But it it worked into the whole thing that he was doing. I don't think Zack Snyder is doing that these days. I think he just wants shock value. You know, he just wants to exploit you know, have some, ex, you know, gun exploitation. Yep. All right, let's see. Ed says, but honestly, though, by not killing the Joker, he's allowing Joker to keep being an insane serial killer. That was, I think, I that, that was, I think, why I liked 89 Batman was Joker died by Batman snaring his foot to the building. It's it's not Batman's job in yeah. And with respect, and, and in my humble opinion, that is not Batman's job. Batman's you know job is to bring them to justice, and you know, but that he's not judge, jury, and executioner. No, but he could take some of Bruce Wayne's money and pay for better security at fucking Arkham. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, you know, you have to reconcile the fact that these are fictional characters with a lot of money riding on them to always be there and you can't you know there's like 37 people in the dc universe with super speed don't you think hiring one of them to be a night guard at arkham so they could stop somebody trying to break out would you be know, a good improvement a good use of bruce wayne's money dan when i was a kid we had the we had a thing called suspension of disbelief <laughs> look jay garrick's old he doesn't want to work at a walmart as a greeter he could be the secure night guard you know, he could still spend his days with his wife. Yeah. See, this is what no, the Joker is of of a type of insanity that's so unique that nothing can hold him. I mean, that's that's like his superpower. If he has superpowers, it's that it's that he can never stay, you know, he will never stay in one place. <laughs> He is so insane that he he almost is slipping around reality, you know, to, they to don't do the even things that he show does. people breaking out of Arkham anymore. It's just a given. 
They just I show hate, up on the street. Batman goes, oh, Penguin's out again. There's I hate the, Arkham so much. I wonder how they're getting out. <laughs> I hate Arkham. Arkham, they need to just totally stop farting around with Arkham for, for like do a moratorium like for five years we're not going to have anything to do with about Arkham the family a new Arkham a, a mass you know jailbreak anything it's like I'm just, no video games no nothing Arkham has been done the second that. richest person in Gotham has to be the night guard at uh, um, Arkham where he's just letting these guys out and they're sending them cash you know, he gets a cut yeah. of their first job when they get out. In the 70s, the Joker used to have a secret room below his padded cell, you know, that he went to relax at the, 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 every time he was caught and put back in jail. I love those days, and I miss those oh days. He didn't right. want to be to escape. <laughs> Mike says, I remember mom saying Batman was too dark. When we went to see it in in eighty nine, but it was a stark difference from the reruns from this. Oh my God, it was on purpose. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was completely on purpose. That was why um, they um, at that time, the, you know, when everybody kept bringing up uh, Biff Bam Pow, you know, their whole marketing strategy was you don't, you know, you don't mention the sixty six Batman TV show. You know, everything that we're doing is to completely wipe that away. Yeah. By the way, did you see the other night on uh, the, the Oscars where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito came out and then Bruce, Will Bruce, uh, not Bruce, <laughs> Michael Keaton's in the audience. Yep. The cravat he's wearing. Yes. Was his own from home. He brought because he wanted to Bruce Wayne it up a bit. Yes. I totally even, wait, it gets better. I even heard it said that he he wanted a little bit of Adam West in how he looked. I hope that's true. I mean, if that's a true story, I just absolutely love that. But yeah, yeah. that was a cute little thing, you know, and I'm glad that they did that. I, I'm sure it was all set up that Michael Keaton was w sitting where he was sitting in that oh. whole thing. Yeah, he talked about they moved him. He was backstage. And they went, "Oh no, we got to get you out front." So okay. it was, it was, it was planted, but it was good. Okay, it, and you know what? Um, credit to all of them for being good sports, even oh, though yeah. Arnold never fought the Michael Keaton fan. <laughs> yep. It says all I read now is indie books. DC and Marvel just keep redoing the same thing back and forth. It's got boring to me. I can totally understand that. Yeah. He says, what about Adam West's Batzuka? He shot the Batzuka in a submarine full of villains. That was awesome. How did they how they didn't die was hilarious. Because it was only meant to um bring the sub up to the surface. That's it, it was more of an their energy blasts, and it's it was to force the sub to come up, not to kill them. I feel like there's a subpar joke there to be made, but I haven't figured out yet. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead. Now, so DC can get your four ninety nine the next month. You know what? Um, going back to the storytelling and stuff like that. My approach when I when I start working on somebody else's property is very simple. Is I feel that I'm playing with a toy from somebody else's toy box, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, I need to put it back in the same condition that I got it. Yep. Put it back the way you you know you found it. Too yeah. many, I think too many writers, and I think that it happens in Hollywood too. Yep, is they want to change the toy. They want to make a lasting impression on the toy, and that a lot of writers and storytellers just they don't just want to tell a story. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to be remembered for. You know, I'm the one that made the new Flash, or I'm the one that gave him the new power, or put Superman in a blue and white costume, yep. or you know, I, I'm the one that made Dick Grayson Batman. It's like, can't you just tell a good story? Yeah, I, and I totally agree with that, and that's why I have a, a, some hope that James Gunn can can bring back something of the classic Superman into what he's doing. Hey, real quick, a, a question about the Pattinson Batman. Is it brought up at all in the film about 
killing or not killing? Is there is that anything? Is there anything in the movie like that? It's not brought up, but he doesn't kill. Okay. There is potential collateral damage because there is a freeway chase scene, mm-hmm. and it looks like cars are crashing, stuff like okay. that. But okay, there's there is no direct kill. Okay. Which you get in just about all the other Batman movies. Have you and you haven't heard anything from what's his name who made it? Um, Matt Reeves. Matt Reeves. I almost said Smith. Matt Reeves. He never went on record as saying that that was purposeful to write it that way or anything like that. Um, you know, I I haven't seen. Okay. But I haven't looked for it either. Okay. But I think that's a really good question. Okay. You know, because he he really focused on the detective aspect of it. But he really, it, it, it's kind of like he was using the Tim Sale, Jeff Loeb Batman books yeah. as his guide, and Batman doesn't kill in there. Yeah, yeah. So I could see that as a... I can almost imagine that should they keep going, and I mean, I know there's supposed to be a sequel, but if they keep going, that, that they may come up against a point where they they need to address that, you know. Um, especially if he if he eventually meets the Joker, I know he's in that cut scene or whatever that thing is, you know. But yeah, if he no, you, faces, you, you, has to face the Joker, you know. Yeah, you do get him at the end of the movie, right? Right. But you don't see him; you just hear him. Okay, so if I remember correctly, the Riddler is a murderer in the movie. The movie starts with it. Okay, so but again, so there's there's no situation, or nobody asked the question. Well, why doesn't Batman just kill the Riddler? Did, did, that didn't come up during that time. Okay, yeah. interesting. Okay. Because he doesn't necessarily catch the Riddler; it's the cops who catch him. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you know, the cops are there, and uh, okay. he doesn't really have a chance. He doesn't interact in, with him directly until later in Arkham. Okay. Okay. And you know how safe Arkham is. Okay. So it sounds like it might not have been necessarily a very purposeful thing, but it's just like it just didn't come up that he was in well, a position to kill people, you know. There, no, there is a point in the movie that he is totally beating the crap out of somebody. Mm-hmm. And gets stopped, I believe, by Selena. Oh, okay. But he had also just taken a huge hit of adrenaline. So he was probably a little off his game anyway. Okay. And they the they, they were on the verge of killing Selena. Okay. So it's sort of pushed towards there and then stopped. I I suppose someday I'll probably watch that movie i I do recommend it i just you know it's it's funny it's my most favorite fictional character of all time and to this still to this day i've had virtually no interest in watching that movie i will Hmm. tell you that i've seen all the batman movies i've seen um the tv shows the animated series Hmm. It, it, it's if it's not the top, it is near the top of Batman mm. takes for me. Mm. Because, and I'm not a Robert Pattinson fan, but it's barely Robert Pattinson. It is Batman. You know, there's there's some you know there's a handful of scenes of Bruce Wayne, but even when he's Bruce Wayne, he's Batman. You know, yeah. the foppish playboy isn't there. Um, I always I, I hate those moments in the movie where Batman is acting like an idiot or Superman is as Clark Kent is act I hate those parts. Hmm. You don't get that in this movie. That's what I've heard, yeah. Yeah. So all right. Looks like we are close to the end. I thought this was a really good conversation. Uh if you haven't yet, please. Hit the like buttons. If you're not subscribed, please do so. Uh, because I, I think we're going to start moving a little more towards these kind of conversations. Maybe we will get to the uh, plethora of stretchy people in the uh, comic book world. 
And and you know what? I I think Dan would love it if if anybody out there feels that they have a have a good you know topic like this one tonight that to suggest it. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. Zach Snyder's not going to feed us topics all the time. So. I know, right? <laughs> Mike Mike is talking about the new Batman or the Batman. Uh -huh. He said it's fantastic. Should watch it. He's completely haunted. See, don't don't tell me that because that pushes me away. Even more. I'm not a fan of a haunted a haunted Batman. I I've said it before. I would like to see something more like uh, an Indiana Jones vibe, an adventure. You know, like a little bit more Batman the Adventurer and Detective. Yeah. You know, than than um, the you know haunted, driven, broken person batman you know See, well no he doesn't come across as broken well hmm. he comes across like a film noir detective he comes across like sam spade hmm. you okay. know at that point he's a force of nature okay. um but it's also the story arc of him going from being just the force of nature the uh the urban legend that scares bad guys to becoming a hero. Mm -hmm. There is a strong, solid character arc of growth for him as well. I've, I've heard that. Yeah. Yes. Let's see. Ed says the Batman is the first time Batman is an actual detective and no crazy far out villains. I love it. It's my favorite Batman of all time, basically. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, it really does feel like like a 70s or a noir detective thriller, you know, because you have your almost Zodiac killer like yeah. you might not like what they do to the Riddler. They do make him a bit more Zodiac killer. Yeah, because because the Riddler is my favorite Batman villain. <laughs> but he also makes a little more sense. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it just depends on what universe you're in. That that's yeah. all. Okay, exactly. it would it would take a lot for that movie to to for me to like it better than the sixty six theatrical Batman movie. I understand that because some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. Yes, which is still the the, the latest interpretation of of Batman on the screen of, of what Batman was at that point. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Um, but you, what's funny is it wasn't the comics that got the Batman movie made; it was the old Saturday matinees. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Hugh Hefner showed them at the Playboy Mansion one night, mm -hmm. and uh, the producers, uh, Greenwood Studios producers or whoever it was, oh uh, Sherwood, Short Sherwood Schwartz. Yep, that's well, yeah, that's the um, yeah uh, Sherwood Schwartz is the uh, is the uh, Gilligan's Island guy for one thing, but yes, yep. Mm -hmm. Well, whoever it was was at the Playboy Mansion and watched all these people just having a great time watching these old Batman matinees mm -hmm. and walked out of there going, we should do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. Because at that point they were considered campy. Yeah. You know, and then camp was such a big deal at that time. Yep. 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 But I've, I've always argued that the, that the, the bat Batman, the way Adam West played it, you know, was, was relatively serious. It got sillier as the show went along. But in the beginning, you know, he was like this deadly serious guy in the middle of this crack, crazy weird world, you know. I always appreciated the fact that he always played it straight. Mm -hmm. That no matter what was happening around him, no matter how silly the lines were, mm -hmm. he played it with a sincere, earnest approach. Yep. And yep. that's why it worked. Yep. There's a funny, famous, funny line where um, somebody had said to him, like his, they were talking about how to play it. And someone said to him, Dr play it like the atomic bomb being dropped on Hiroshima. And that that informed his his portrayal uh, yeah. of, of Batman. Yeah, it's funny if you look at different generations and and who were their first a, pr a first um, version of these characters, yep. you know, people our age, we grew up with George Reeves, uh, Adam West and Linda Carter. So we have one specific mm -hmm. vision of these yeah. characters. And then yeah. the next group up, 
grew up with Christopher Reeves and Michael Keaton and that's, they've got their version, yeah. you know, and then up along the line. And there, there are people now who grew up with Christian Bale and, uh, yeah. Brandon Routh as their Batman and Superman. And you know, you know what? And I want to say for the record, I totally get it. If, if you, where you grew up and why you would, you know, I totally get it that today this no killing thing doesn't necessarily make sense, you know, because of the world that you, that these you've grown up in. So I totally get that. You know, I'm, I'm not saying like, um, like why would anybody ever think that? I totally get that. It's just a different mindset and it's a different era that, you know, we grew up in, you, you know, you said it perfectly. That's, that's exactly what it is. Um, um, I I would I like I like the idea of trying to show why a superhero shouldn't kill. You know, go, like go down that road and 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 you know. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I would rather dance him right up to that edge mm. and give him a good reason to pull back than yeah. actually have him cross that line. That's my argument with Man of Steel. You can put him right up to that edge, but make him figure out a way around it. At least show him trying to figure out a way around it. At the very least, he should have thrown himself in front of Zod's eye beams because that's what Superman would do. And yet, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I guess if it would have killed him, but that's what he would have done to save innocence. He would have sacrificed himself. Or if you really want, okay, now we're going long, but I'm sorry. If you, yeah. if you really want a dramatic moment in the movie, uh -huh. instead of having him snapping his neck, you have Superman drop down in front of the family and fire his eye beams back, yeah, and with more intensity, and you see the the beams hit and then start going back, going back, and eventually they go and he hits Zod in the eyes, burning out his eyes. Yeah, maybe, yeah, he's not dead, he's just blinded, you know? Yeah. There are so many different solutions to that, and unfortunately, they chose, you know, the 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 one that I hate would hate the most, and then not deal with it. Again, you're going to do that, then, then deal with it. You know, he could have grabbed Zod and tried to fly up through the roof and up into space. You know, I mean, there's how many, he could have tried to put his own hand in front of it. And yeah, it would have burned his hand. But, but again, there's so many different things other than just taking that quick way out, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think Zack Snyder uh, wears a t-shirt that says, I woke up this morning and chose unconsequential violence. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Great topic tonight, Dan. We filled a whole hour with it. <laughs> yep. And we got some of our best views. So good job. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for the likes and the hearts and stuff. If you haven't hit the buttons, please do. Also, like I said, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. We do this show mostly every Sunday night. Sometimes we miss one, but overall we're here. And uh, I think we are going to drift a little more to this as, you know, we'll still cover new shows when they come out or, but mm -hmm. I think topics like this will be a lot of fun. Yeah, and it was right. kind of what I originally wanted to do with pop go the writers. Yeah. So uh, it says that was fun. Take care. Thank you, Ed. I will see you on the show this week. Everyone have a great time. Stay healthy. 